Okay, I finally watched Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, the second coaster in the upcoming Indiana Jones Trilogy 4K Blu-ray set. So what did I think of it? Well, for starters, it's not nearly as bad as some of the internet makes it out to be. I wouldn't say it's a good movie, but it's mostly serviceable. And I would say it is better than uh, Legend of the Crystal Skull or... Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, uh, mostly because it doesn't have any really, really stupid parts in it. I mean, it has a lot of plot holes, but it doesn't have nobody swinging on vines. In my opinion, as a lifelong Indiana Jones fan, this movie doesn't ruin Indiana Jones. I mean, he's definitely kind of like old and washed up, but I think that's kind of the point. The uh, Helena Shaw, she is sometimes annoying. But I wouldn't call her insufferable. I mean, she doesn't she doesn't ruin the movie. I, I mean, I think there is something that definitely damages the movie, but I'll get, get on to that a little later. Fairly straightforward adventure. It starts with a flashback in 1944, 1945. See, that part's not quite clear. You know, they're like on this train trying to find these artifacts, and the train is just loaded up with all sorts of artifacts. It's like they're trying to take them or hide them or something i don't even know if they actually say what the date is so yeah i mean it, you, you get the impression that it, yeah it is the it would be the end of the war because indiana jones says berlin's in ruins your leader is hiding you've lost uh the de-aging i thought looked fine the thing that's way more distracting is the fact that they don't even bother to de-age his voice so it sounds really weird hearing it come out of a young looking indiana jones if it's 1944, 1945, Indiana Jones, his character would be 46. He looks a little too young. So it makes me kind of wonder if some of the old rumors might have been true. I'll get to that later. Because, uh, what was it? Uh, Last Crusade took place in 1938, so he would have been 39. So he looks, he doesn't look any older than he does in Last Crusade. If anything, he might look slightly younger, which is kind of weird. Yeah, so they're on this train and they uh, find part of the dial of destiny there's also like the subplot with the um the spear of De destiny or the lance of long gallus or whatever the you know the tip of the spear that the romans stuck in the side of jesus christ on the when he's being crucified to finish him off but then it's like it's a fake it's like okay that's that's interesting and all but why is it's weird that that's such a big plot point even though it's completely irrelevant to the plot yeah so the, they they managed to get off the train and uh, they have this die with them. And there's, there's, there's like this, there's this guy who's like Indy's friend. Like, I don't know what his name was. He's like the father of the Phoebe Waller-Bridge character. Indy's like, here, you can have the dial. And then apparently this character gets obsessed with the dial. And it drives him mad trying to figure out what it does. Because it's only like one half of the dial. Uh, yeah, so a lot of people like rave about the opening scene. I thought it was maybe a little too long. And also, like most Disney movies these days, it's like way too dark. It's like, why? I, well, I'm... I asked rhetorically. I know why they make those scenes so dark. It's because they can skimp on the CGI. But yeah, it was kind of hard to see what was going on in some parts. Like when the cars and the motorcycles are driving around in the forest. It's like, you kind of, you're like, okay, this is why they kind of have all these like overly, overly artificially lit uh, wood scenes in movies where there's obvious like sky, skylights in the background behind trees. It's because that way you can see what's going on. But yeah, it's an all right scene, except for there's a part in the beginning where the the Nazis have captured Indiana Jones and somehow they don't know who he is. You'd think he'd be quite famous at that point. And like, if I was a Nazi and I caught Indiana Jones, I would just immediately kill him. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste any time with any formalities. So the, the way in which he escapes in the very beginning is pretty silly. Like when you see it, it's like, there's no way he would have survived that. Flash forwards to the present, 1969. Indiana Jones is like a washed up loser, I guess. And uh, he drinks like instant coffee, which I can't imagine a 70 year old would be making instant coffee in 1969. And he puts whiskey in it. And apparently he's retiring. So he, he's giving a, a lecture in his class. And it's kind of weird. Like they made all the students like really like bored. Like, you know, obviously they look like, you know, a bunch of like 1960s hippies. But it's like, is, is this a classroom from 1969 or 2023 where like the students don't give a crap? I mean, I guess that's kind of the point, but it kind of felt out of place, especially for a college. But then, yeah, uh, Helena Shaw, the Phoebe Waller-Bridge character, she shows up and she's like, oh, we've got to go find the Dial of Destiny. I think it's in this, in this river. And Harrison Ford is like, it's not in a river. I have it. So then it turns out there's this um, rocket engineer 
I can't remember his name is the Mads Nicholson character. And he's basically supposed to be Werner von Braun. And he's in the opening scene as well. He's on the train. Although it's really weird because the way he falls off the train, it's like, how on earth did he live? So anyway, yeah, he's, he's got a bunch of goons and it's like, oh, I got the men to the moon or whatever, even though that really has no bearing on the plot. Uh, yeah, so he's looking for the Dial of Destiny. Basically, everyone, everyone's looking for the Dial of Destiny, and Indiana Jones has had half of it this whole time. So there's a bunch of like chase sequences. There's like a ticker tape parade for like the moon landing. I guess that's kind of all right. I mean, I, I did like there was one part where uh, they're drag the bad guys, the like the thugs are like dragging Indy through the parade, and Indy starts yelling like uh, no 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 war peace or whatever in a group of hippies, and I think he's trying to like get them to like turn on it or like you know start a riot or whatever so we can get free the, the part i thought was kind of cool in that in that part was like one of the henchmen fires his gun into the air and all the hippies immediately drop down to the ground and the only person who doesn't drop down of course is indy and like oh look there he is so there's a big chase there and it's you know it's one of those chases where horses are somehow magically faster than like cars or, or subway trains and it's all right although <laughs> okay gonna be pedantic the part where he's riding a horse into a subway it's like if you've ever been to new york city the subway, the subways were old even in the 1960s when this movie took place. Like, if you're like, if you're like a really tall person, your your head is almost touching the roof of those subway tunnels because they they were built long ago when people were shorter. Uh, yeah, so it's like there's no way someone can actually ride a horse through there. Uh, yeah, uh, but whatever. And then what is it? Oh, then he gets accused of murder. I was talking about plot threads. Like, there's this CIA agent lady, and for some reason she's helping. The, uh, but the bad guys, I don't know why. It's like, I think the CIA also wants the Dial of Destiny or something. And it's just kind of confusing because it's like, what is her association with these ex-Nazis? Why is she helping them? That's never really flushed out. Indiana Jones gets accused of murdering two random people. And so he's on the run. It's like, oh no, Indy, he's on the run. And there's this great scene where Indy's watching a TV through a window of a store. You know, that old cliche. And this guy walks up, he's like... You're the guy on TV. And he starts saying, hey, I found the murderer. I found the murderer. And then wham, off camera, Sala has like knocked the guy out. He's like, Indy, I came as fast as I could. And Sala's like a cab driver now. At this point, uh, Helena has stolen the dial from Indy. So she kind of betrays him. And it's kind of, it's like, this is like his goddaughter. Like her father and Indy were great friends. And, you know, she knew Indy growing up. And then she locks him in a room with a bunch of Nazis, unarmed, in a room with a bunch of Nazis and a CIA agent who appears to be nebulous. And it's like, you kind of left him behind to die? That was kind of weird. So, yeah, her character kind of starts out. It kind of almost reminds me of the Ray Winstone character from uh, Crystal Skull, although she is only kind of a nebulous character in the first part of the movie. She actually becomes his partner later on, and she no longer tries to betray him. So after that, they go to Tangier, and uh, there's like an auction, and uh, Helena is trying to sell off the dial, and there's that really stupid line about capitalism. It's actually edited really well, but it still makes no sense. Everyone aims their gun at Indy and then graciously allows him to drop to the floor before they start shooting. Stuff like that is kind of dumb. I mean, it, 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 it's funny if you watch it, but it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But it's still not swinging on vines dumb. So then there's a big chase scene in Tangier, and it's not just the Nazis. There's also uh, this guy who I guess is like some local mobster, and he was dating or engaged to Helena. So he's like, you broke my heart and sold our engagement ring. So he's chasing them as well. So it's like three groups chasing each other. And it's a pretty decent chase scene, except for you're supposed to believe a tuk tuk could you know, even remotely come close to the speed of a car to catch up with it. Helena has her own short round, uh, a little kid named Teddy. It's the same thing. He's like driving cars and picking pockets. Then his backstory is like the same as Short Round. She's like, oh, he, he picked my pocket and then I hit him with a car door and then we became friends. So the movie is not bad. It's definitely better than a lot of people on the internet are letting on. Although I still think, I still believe all of the rumors about what they had shot or what they reshot because it's pretty evident once you get into the, into the later parts of the movie. So then they kind of go on this quest like, oh, we got to find the other half of the dial. Oh, and then first we have to find this thing, which leads to the other half of the dial. And the other half of the dial is in the tomb of Archimedes, which sounds like something from God of War, which is in Sicily, I think. And of course, in the opening scene where Indy is talking to his college students, he's describing the siege of Syracuse, which of course comes up later in the movie. And then, yeah, so it's, it's not too bad. It's, Indy doesn't spend 
the whole movie captured like he does in Crystal Skull. So I'd say that's an improvement. Uh, he he definitely is like a grouchy old man, but I guess Indiana Jones probably would become a grouchy old man. It may be a little too much of Harrison Ford is seeping into the character. But then about halfway through the movie, like if you were to watch this and never have heard of any of the rumors, not follow any of the production or the one year delay in release, you would probably just think the movie ends kind of abruptly. But if you do <laughs> read all the rumors and you hear about at least two sets of reshoots, it's pretty obvious that it happened. So even though the movie turned out decent, it was still obviously massively reworked. And about the middle of the movie, there's a few things where, like, there's a shot of Mads Nicholson looking through binoculars, and there's a voiceover of, oh, they're heading west. And it's like, oh, that feels patched in. Something in the end sequence also seems a little patched in. So, you know, basically there's a couple more chases. They find the tomb. Then Indy gets shot, like, above the heart, but still, I mean... A, pretty bad place to get shot so he spends probably like the last 20 to 30 minutes of the movie wearing a bullet in his chest and it's like how is he alive i mean you know he's obviously he's indiana jones and he's super tough but he's also like well remember he's not 80 in the movie they cheat his age like they do in most of these movies he's supposed to be 70 that's still pretty old as was rumored the movie does absolutely involve time travel they try to make it all scientific it's like they, and they call the device they call it they, they don't call it the dial of destiny they, they call it the antikythera it's like oh this is the antikythera whereas in reality the thing they base it off of is the antikythera mechanism and it's called that because it was found at a place called antikythera so it's the mechanism from antikythera not the antikythera I mean, there's people who think the Antikythera mechanism was made by Archimedes, and if anyone would have made it, it probably would have been him, but it still was kind of distracting how they kind of misnomered it. So anyway, yes, the big plan is Mads Nicholson, who is, was a, is a Nazi, whatever, however you want to say it, he's like, I'm going to go back in time and kill Hitler in 1939, and that way we can win the war because I know every mistake Hitler made. See, again, okay, in my earlier videos, I posited that they would try to take nuclear bomb secrets back in time because that would be a really good way to win a war it's like what could you really change i mean would you not invade poland maybe how do you win a war if you don't start a war i mean really as soon as the united states and especially russia got involved germany was going to lose the war unless of course they had developed a nuclear bomb first which is the subject of the movie Oppenheimer, of which we saw a trailer for in front of this movie. But the movie's not really about that. So it's like, don't understand, especially like if you went back to 1939, like if you really wanted to go back in time and kill Hitler and become Hitler, it seems like you should go at least 10 years further back in time. And I mean, I mean the early rumors were that they did originally go further back in time. They went back to like the early 1930s. Even that probably wouldn't have been early enough. Like in the third act, they're in this plane and then Helena is driving a motorcycle up to the plane and she climbs inside the landing gear. That might have been like the almost like the swinging on vines part because it's like, wow, this is the, it's like in a thunderstorm. She's on this little dinky motorcycle chasing a plane on a runway, grabbing on the landing gear. It's like that's it's like she should, probably should have died. And then she crawls into the plane and she's somehow able to crawl around inside the plane like there's a bunch of John McClane tubes on the plane. It's like, nah, that's weird. But Indy is like, the dial is not calculated properly archimedes didn't know about continental drift it's changed in 2000 years and it's like oh so see that's that right there is like that makes no sense that kind of makes me think that they they threw that in as a way to change the ending because do the continents drift in 2000 years yes is it in any any appreciable amount no you would have to go back hundreds of millions of years before it would actually be in effect at least 50 million years not 2,000 years. Remember, the Earth is really, really old. 2,000 years is nothing. So yeah, they end up in ancient uh, Syracuse. It's like, oh, look, the Romans are attacking the, uh, the Greeks. I guess the, the premise was Archimedes built the dial so that someone in the future would come back in time and save his island from the Romans. It's like, huh? And again, it's like, that's the plot? It's like, that seems really flimsy. It seems like something that was changed later on. And the thing that's really dumb, too, is like, you know, they're kind of freaking out because Indy's like, oh, you're going to go to the wrong time period. They go through the portal and then both of the planes immediately nosedive, but they regain control. And then what did they do? It's like, oh, let's fly like 20 feet over this sea battle. It's obviously because, oh, you know, we want to we want to get the plane down there. Well, there's a reason for them to go down there. They basically like, fly this German warplane, like seriously, 20 feet above the sea. And then guess what? They start getting hit by like arrows and ballistas and stuff. Isn't realistic at all. It just seems kind of ridiculous. And then 
<laughs> the Nazis are like shooting the Romans. They're like they just grab machine guns and stick them on the side of the plane and start shooting the Romans for absolutely no reason. I guess because they're shooting like ballistas at them. But it's like you're in a plane. I don't know. Maybe like pull up. And it's established later on. They can just go right back through the time portal. So it just it just really seems obvious that they they changed the ending and then they had them do really stupid things like get hit by, you know, it's like, oh, look, here's a plane. It's flying like 120 miles an hour. We've never seen this before, but we're going to be able to hit this with our catapults with like, you know, big fiery balls. It just seems kind of dumb. It's like the movie is quite decent until you get to like the last third. And it's like, and it still, it still manages to be okay, but you, you can definitely tell that there was an original third act that was changed at some point. And then you can also tell that there was a different final ending that was also changed, and that was the rumored reshoots that happened earlier this year. That was the one where the director was like, oh, no, this didn't happen. But then John Williams was like, yeah, they're shooting another ending. They're like, oh, no, that didn't happen. It's like, eh, I don't know. Because the, you get to the point where it's like, oh, Indy's like, I'm dying. Let me die here in the past. And Phoebe Waller-Bridge is like, but you can't stay here. You'll change history. Never mind there's a crashed 20th century airship that crashed right in the city. Didn't It didn't crash in the water. It crashed right in the city. This isn't going to change history, apparently. There's machine guns on it. This isn't going to change history. But Indy staying in the past would? So I think the original ending, they probably did have Indy just die in the past. And then the other people go back to the future in the airplane. I mean, I, I was glad to see, like, you know, Archimedes is, like, holding the complete... You see Archimedes building the dial. And then he's like, oh, there's a commotion outside. I need to stop building this dial and go outside and, you know, see the planes flying around. And then he, he picks up the completed dial that the Nazis took back in time. And that's the thing, like, all the Nazi bad guys, all they do is they just... Their plane just crashes and they die. That's it. There's, like, that's how they die. It's kind of lame. So he picks up the dial and then, you know, Helena and... Archimedes and Indiana Jones are arguing, and then she's like, oh, and by the way, we've got to take that dial back with us. And she's like, yeah, that's a good point. Like, you can't leave that here with Archimedes because he has to build the dial first. I think they probably are originally had it where Indy dies in, in ancient Greece, but then I think what they did for this final ending change is she just punches, she punches Indiana Jones, which I'm, I'm perfectly fine with because Indiana Jones was like, just about dead. He could barely walk at that point. I, I could totally buy that she could punch him out. It's probably not the safest thing to do, but she knocks him out. And then Indiana Jones wakes up in bed back in his apartment. And he's like, oh, we've come back to the present. And it's like, oh, I guess they must have flown the little plane that the kid was flying. So I don't know. I can, I can buy a kid driving a car, a kid flying a plane. And they even say, I've never flown a plane before. But maybe that's why they had the pilot sleeping in the back of the plane, because they wanted some plausibility of the plane being able to take off again and fly through a portal after they went back in time. But none of that is shown because they probably didn't film it. They probably said the cheapest way to do this is to have her punch him out, cut to black, and then go back to the apartment. And there is a really nice scene in the end where Indy's like, oh, my life sucks. And then Marion shows back up. And they're both grieving. Actually, one of the best scenes in the movie is about halfway through where he's talking about what happened to uh, Shia LaBeouf. And spoiler warning, he's like, my son joined the army, went into, went to Vietnam. And she's like, did he do it to make you proud? He's like, no, he did it to piss me off. But, and she's, she's asking him, like, what if this is a time machine? What would you do if you could go back in time? And he's like, I would go back in time and tell my son not to go to war because he would die and it would break his mother's heart and destroy our marriage. That's like actually some really good acting from Harrison Ford. So in the end of the movie, Marion comes back to their apartment. She's got some groceries. And there's a really nice scene, and he's like, everything hurts. It's basically calling back to the scene on the boat in Raiders. And then he kisses her elbow, and then they kiss a couple... Well, it's basically that scene. But it is really touching. It's like, oh, that's cute. And then I guess everything's okay. And then the other characters go for some ice cream, and then Indy grabs his hat off a windowsill for some reason, and that's the end of the movie. Is it a good movie? Eh. Is it a decent movie? Totally. I guess I would recommend it. It's it's definitely better than you've probably heard online. It's not like, oh, it's amazing, I loved it. I also wouldn't trust those reviews either. The biggest problem it has is that, yes, they clearly, they clearly had a different third act, and they changed it for, what, for whatever reason. Now, you could go and look up the rumors online of what that original reason was. Pretty hard to believe, although it's also pretty obvious that they made major changes, so who knows what happened then. And that footage is probably in the same vault with the Star Wars Christmas special, so we'll probably never find out what happens. So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty decent movie. 
but the fact that there were obvious major changes to the plot, especially in the third act, damages the movie because they patch it together as best they can, but there's definitely huge cracks that weaken the structure. And there's also other plot points that are completely left hanging, like the CIA lady, and I guess Indiana Jones is no longer wanted for murder because he time-traveled or something. There's a part where he says, I have to get the dial back because it's the only way to clear my name whatever that means. I would say if you go into it with an open mind and just, uh, you know, obviously don't expect the best movie ever. And when you get to the end, if the end feels confusing, just know that there was a different ending and that's why they chopped it up and changed it. Uh, Yeah, so that's my review for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. I guess it was more of a synopsis than a review. I don't know if I ever need to see it again. I would say I liked it better than, at least on the first watching, I liked it better than Crystal Skull. The major problems of this movie are structural or reshoot related. I think for the average person that doesn't know about any of that alleged history, you can enjoy it for what it is. You'll probably think the ending is weird and abrupt, but I still think it ends in a decently satisfying way. Although, again, we never needed more than three Indiana Jones movies. So there you go, my review of Dial of Destiny. Now playing for a few more days at least, because it's not doing very well. I think the major problem really was, I don't think anyone really needed Crystal Skull, but you know people liked Last Crusade, so they're like, oh, I'm going to check out Crystal Skull. Crystal, Crystal Skull didn't go over very well, so they shouldn't be that surprised that 15 years later, general audiences aren't really interested in this, especially when you have, again, they say that Indy's 70, but we all know Harrison Ford is like 80, and you know he definitely acts like an old man in this, and it's just... I don't want to say it's like, it doesn't make the movie unbelievable. It's just, who really wants to see that? You know, every guy wants to be a 37-year-old Indiana Jones. Every woman wants to be with a 37-year-old Indiana Jones. Nobody wants to be 80 years old. So there's not a whole lot of wish fulfillment with that left. I think that's part of the problem why people might not be interested. But uh, yeah, as a lifelong Indiana Jones fan, I would say not nearly as terrible as many have said. Probably better than Crystal Skull and... And also, yeah, another thing, it was two and a half hours long, and I really don't like when movies are overly long, but I didn't actually feel like it felt too long. I mean, it probably could have been shortened, but it didn't drag as much as some other two and a half hour long movies I've seen. So yeah, I guess check it out if you're interested. Make your own decisions.